Two Kids and a Career is a production of Jill Divine Media. When I hit my bottom, um, and my bottom looked like uh, going through a divorce and loss of a company, and um, everybody that I've ever known pissed off and disappointed at me, you know, that unfortunately had to be my bottom. It is what it is, and it took that, unfortunately, for me to wake up. There was nobody left around me to blame um, in my life that they're at fault. And you, because you did this or because you didn't do this, you know, which is typical of, of alcoholic behavior, it took me getting to that point. Two Kids in a Career is brought to you by Blondin Real Estate. They're a family-owned boutique-style brokerage with over 40 years of experience serving the counties that surround St. Louis. See the properties they have to offer at BlondinRealEstate.com. That's BlondinRealEstate.com. Hi there, and welcome to Two Kids in a Career. I'm Jill Devine. As an entrepreneur, wife, and mama, the daily grind of trying to build a business while taking care of kids and trying to maintain a healthy connection with my hubby, it's a lot. With this podcast, you're going to hear candid conversations with other moms, parenting experts who can share their knowledge and insight, or you'll just hear me rambling to get it all out. There's going to be tears, there's going to be laughter, but most importantly, there will be support. Take a listen and connect with me so we can grow and learn from one another. This is Two Kids and a Career. Welcome to episode 75. A couple of housekeeping notes at the beginning of the episode. I would like for you to take some time and head to wherever you're listening uh, this podcast right now and subscribe, rate, and review the podcast because that will help get this podcast in the hand of, of others. And then stick around until the very end because we have our super mom shout out brought to you by Addie's Way. So I am super excited about this episode and a little nervous. And let me explain why. Um, so I have Sean Rademeyer joining me and anyone that is listening that is from the area of the St. Louis area and they went to school with me. You probably know who Sean is. So first, welcome Sean to the podcast. Hi, Jill. Thanks for having me on. All right. I will do a little bit of what I consider how we know each other and you can chime in along the way. So again, back to the local area, I went to Francis Howell High School. And for some reason, Francis Howell High School used to always hang out with the kids at St. Dominic, which was a, or still is actually a Catholic school in the area as well. And so I met Sean through some mutual friends, um, probably the one we probably really did know each other was Natalie. Natalie and I worked together at a frozen yogurt place called Iggy's. And there were other people that we knew. And and that's how Sean and I know each other. I would say that it wasn't like we hung out all the time or good friends, but we were friends. I mean, yeah. we knew of one another. Yes. So um, I did know uh, from back to Natalie from some of the, her close girlfriends, Sean was involved with one of those girls for a long time and they had a baby, which we'll talk about, but that was a baby. What age were you? Um, I was Jill 19 or excuse me. I was 20 and uh, Barb who you're referring to. She, uh, she was 19 at the time. So I knew that you guys had a baby girl and then I just kind of through mutual friends, you know, would see what's going on with you. I knew that you, um, ended up meeting someone else. You guys got married and you had two kids. And then there wasn't much that I had seen, but I had heard, and I told Sean this before this conversation, that there was some addiction. I didn't know what, um, but that you, Sean, were trying to figure some things out. And then again, uh, not seeing much happening on social media or anything. Um, then I see you come back onto social media and you were very open about things that you had been going through or had gone through. And you were so thankful that you had God in your life now because yes. this is what saved you. And yep. so that's all I know. And I am so glad that you reached out to me because I know that you have a story like everyone else does, but
but a story of hope and a story of never giving up. And so let's share that story. Let's talk about it. Uh, do you want to go back to childhood? Where would you like to begin? Well, first off, uh, you know, formally, thank you for uh, letting me be on here today. I, uh, you know, obviously you mentioned that we had some mutual acquaintances um, and, you know, I, I was touched with um, hearing Corey's wife come on the show. Uh, and for those of you that uh, aren't aware, Corey had, had passed away, uh, you know, over over a year ago from substance abuse and some other issues that he was having. Um, you know, and obviously the, the uh, subject is near and dear to my heart. It's been a part of my life. Um, there's uh, 10 years of my life have been spent um, understanding, you know, what, what are the root causes of addiction? Um, you know, what, why do people have substance abuse issues? You know, and uh, and there's been a lot of healing that's occurred over a long period of time. And, you know, um, most importantly, Jill, when a, when a loved one or family member uh, is afflicted uh, with with the illness, most people, they don't know what to do or, or, or know how to handle it properly. Um, and, it, and that always seems to be the case. And so um, I, I've also gone through some experiences with, um, you know, abuse. Uh, with with dealing with narcissistic personalities, and so I, I want to share uh, part part of my journey with you, and and hopefully maybe that it reach a person or two uh, that are that are in situations either abuse uh, themselves, not know not knowing how to get out, um, or uh, you know that that a loved one in their family or they maybe themselves are, are having addiction issues and are are, are shrouded in sh- uh, shame you know, not, not knowing how to ask for help or, or what, you know, what to do. So that's, that's more or less the reason why I reached out. You just never know, uh, who's, you know, where this podcast is going to, is going to land and hopefully, uh, you know, it's used for the right purposes and it, and it gets somebody the help they need. Absolutely. I had said at the beginning of this episode that I was nervous and I think it's nervous because, not that it doesn't impact me when I'm talking to a complete stranger, but someone that I know and someone that I know, I mean, you're in my backyard, so to speak. Like, I know that I can call you up and we can meet. And so it is hard for, I think, loved ones uh, to hear the stories and to understand, but that's where we have to start. That's where yeah. we have to to get there. And um it's just one of those things, too, where I think about how sometimes people will give up on others for whatever the reason is. And, and I understand boundaries. I 100 percent get it. Yep. But I also believe that there are people who can change and people who can grow. Um, there are people that maybe say people can't change. Maybe that's true, but there's definitely something that can be learned. Maybe I, I just yeah. feel that we have to listen to people and second chances are OK. Um, but yeah, figuring out that boundary, too, is also OK. And so when someone's completely lost, we may not understand and we may not get it, but yeah. it's not up to us right now for that. So yeah. uh, let, let's just dive into it. Sure. Um, sure. And talk I'm, about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. So, uh, you know, that that's the the gist of my story. You know, I, uh, I, I had I had the, the life, I guess, that uh, everyone could could want and be grateful for. Um, and, you know, internally, um, inside of me, um, I was becoming an increasing mess, uh, not not truly understanding uh, what was happening um, inside of me or why I was having the feelings that I was having um, or or certainly any healthy outlets uh, on, on, on or understanding how to deal with what was happening inside of me. And, and you know, so is the case without, you know, alcoholism or substance abuse. Um uh, why do people have chemical dependency issues? Um, you know, and the, the, the base reason is, is that the, the, 
their perception of reality, you know, they're, they're obviously having a hard time with, um, you know, how they're feeling and how they're relating to the world. Um, and so the, the need to not have to feel that is why someone's um, gravitating to chemical dependency. And, and the, the reasons are different, Jill, for each person. Um, but, but after 10 years of, of observation, watching, being involved um, in various programs, learning uh, from, from very qualified teachers that specialized in substance abuse, spending time with people that really understood this, this deal um, and learning from them. You know, I've, I've gained some insights that, um, you know, there's, there's some commonality uh, across the board uh, with, with all people. And so I'll, I want to share some of those with you. So maybe, maybe it helps somebody that uh, is, is upset or angry um, or, or feeling out of control, uh, you know, with a, with a loved one that's just gone off the rails. And so I'll start with my story, you know, that I started and I kind of fast forward a little bit, but you know, at high school, um, we, you and me shared a similar group of friends, um, you know, and that, and that's how we did know one another, you know, more on an acquaintance level than, than a deeper friendship level. Um, and, and life, just moved on and you went your way and I went mine. Um, you know, Heidi, uh, my daughter is now, uh, she just recently graduated college down at Mizzou and, and, uh, is heading Crazy. off. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and she's, she's heading down, um, or, or off already in, in California. And I'm happy for her that, um, you know, she, she created the pathway in her life to, to, you know, to follow her dreams and, and, uh, is living the way that she wants to. And, you know, I was, I'm grateful that I got the opportunity to come out of that place that uh, most didn't think I would uh, and share some of, of my life lessons with her. Um, you know, and I like to think that that had some influence on her, you know, uh, but I, I think, I think it planted seeds nonetheless inside of her. And so I'm, I'm delighted to see her life moving on with uh, high hopes and she seems happy, which is all a parent can ever want, you know. And, and then, uh, yes, I did. I did get married uh, and, and went on and, and had uh, a couple kids, um, you know, that that uh, are named Max and Ava. And so um, at the same time, I was I was building a, a company that um, that grew rather quickly, you know, back around 2003. And, and I was actually really surprised at how fast it was growing and, and looking back at it. And hopefully it'll make some sense in the end. Um you know, it was a, it, it was a time bomb, a ticking time bomb waiting to happen in my life because, um, you know, I, in high school, you know, st started to drink on occasion and, uh, and, and even engage in other substances here and there. But, uh, by college began, began as all people that usually have substance abuse problems that end up in recovery, you know, began blackouts, um, and, and partying out of control, um, and, and then uh, eventually, you know, uh, those years that we parted ways and, and went off and started a family and, and started a business, um, you know, never really grew out of the habit, which, which you know, is usually a clear um, indicator of, of who has the illness and who doesn't. You know, people are able to step away from that party life um, and, and, that, and that craziness. And, and uh, I was still stuck in it. And uh, I... I also can say today from the place I'm in that I, I, I needed that still in my life. Um, and, and I'll talk to you briefly about childhood stuff and alcoholic, uh, how alcoholism flows through families and um, it, how it gets passed down. Um, and, and that's where I was at, Jill, a, a rapidly growing company, um, you know, that, um, that uh, you know, in hindsight, again, um, I had a lot of uh, a lot of ways to not have to feel in my life. Uh, workaholism was being one of them. Um, you know, it suppresses suppresses emotions and having to deal with the uh, uncomfortableness inside of you. Um, and so it was a perfect combination, you know, to hide behind um, what I was feeling on the inside, which it, which in my case, as, as, as in the case of, you know, many other people with addiction, and alcoholism is, you know, that um, inferiority complex that uh, I am that I am not enough wound inside of you. And, and as a recovering codependent, um, that that disposition to reach outside of yourself 
for things external uh, to make you feel better about yourself uh, because you're not able to generate those feelings of, of self-worth inside of you. And so, you know, that's the vicious cycle that ends and lands people uh, in long-term substance abuse and, and eventually becomes so, so problematic uh, and, and there's not enough substances that they can put in them. To, to keep those feelings suppressed because they're eventually coming out of you. And uh, that's the, that's the pathway my life was heading, uh, working myself to death, um, total inability to uh, love myself uh, in the respect of, you know, having any sort of healthy balance in my life, um, which, you know, which looks like, you know, going home at regular hours and, and, and making time for the family Um you know, and, and, and eating healthy uh, um, and, you know, and, and doing family oriented things on the weekends. Um, you know, that that wasn't the way my life was unfolding. Um, uh, it, it all seemed normal to me to be living the way that I was at the time, just because other people that you're hanging around um, are also living the same way. And so uh, you know, that's, that's usually the case, Jill, with, with people with substance abuse issues or that are heading down that path. You know, you all hang around one another um, and, and you're completely oblivious to the fact that other people are living different ways, you know, um, and, and, and the ways that others are living, which is, you know, it's the majority of the people, um, you know, it seems so foreign and it doesn't seem fun. Um, and it seems like something when you're in the middle of substance abuse, you want no part of. Um, and so a way to stay in denial that there's a problem with it is you just surround yourself with people that are that are living the same way you are. Well, I was going to ask about that because ironically, I was I've been listening to this uh, true crime podcast and uh, part of the conversation, well, a lot of it, it centered around drugs that these individuals that are suspects, it, it's, it's drug related and sure. they're interviewing the friends in the family. And they're like, yes, my child had a drug problem. And I, and I don't know if this is, I mean, I don't, I don't want to say I have a healthy brain. I don't know. I'm, I, I, what I think about and exactly what you were saying is how do these individuals at, at one point they know drugs? I mean, I think most people know drugs are bad for you, sure. right? Like how at, were they thinking like, this is okay, whatever they were doing, but was it just this downward spiral? Like they, they, they couldn't get out of. And I did think that exact same thing that you said that I wondered ever if these individuals look at people that are sober or not doing drugs and they're like, I aspire to be that way. Or do you know, that's just, yeah, we're, we're the dumb ones. We don't know how it is. I mean, I just hear all these really terrible stories about the drug use and the way it makes them feel, but they're not doing anything to get out of it. And that's totally ignorant on my part because I don't understand and I don't know. Well, and, and that goes back to the previous statement I made about from what my eyes see, um, from the research, uh, from what, you know, treatment centers are, are trying to get people that are coming in to see what long-term recovery programs, um, show you, um, they all yield the same answers. And, and that is generally that there's, there's a wounding, you know, and that, that, that need to escape reality. And so when you're looking at people are making bad choices, you know, yes, dr you know, drugs are dangerous. Um, it, it seems innocent, but, but to a person that has trauma, uh, or, or does not you know, that, that has that predisposition where they get that great feeling that masks the, the, the lifelong pain that they're used to, but they don't know that it's there. And so the feeling and the euphoria, uh, the relief that they get, uh, the reward is so much greater than a person that's, you know, that doesn't have those issues that might have tried those things one or two times and, and, and wakes up and doesn't feel good, um, you know, from doing it. That's what a healthy person would do. It's, it's not the same to a person that is carrying those things uh, and they're having a totally different reaction 
and, and and so when they get that relief from those those emotions uh, that they that they may not necessarily know if they haven't landed in, in any long term consequences of you know of substance abuse or landed themselves in a treatment center or done any introspection or or work on themselves they don't know that they're wounded and they don't know that that that's the reason why they're 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 so gravitating to that and why. Um, it's so powerful to them. Um, I hope that I hope that helps you understand a little bit a little bit better. It does because some of the descriptions of some of these individuals in this podcast, the host does say he's like they had trauma yes. that happened to them, and and explained a little bit about that. And I mean, I this is just a side note. Like I just feel like it's this cycle because then those individuals have kids and then yes. you know what i'm saying like it just keeps going and so you just hope that somebody can break that cycle but um yeah so well that and, i just that's what i wanted to chime in yeah and and no and thank you for bringing that point up i mean you know jill right now i'm working with some some larger organizations on you know developing programs for generational healing and families uh because, you know, um, most of the time, all of the time, let's say that, um, you know, there, there could be an alcoholic back four generations and, and his drinking affected four different generations of people in the family. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and one of those main, um, you know, side effects of having an alcoholic in the family, you know, it, it results uh, and they're becoming a codependent in the family, you know, a person that's living with an active alcoholic. Um, and, and that has a whole different set of behaviors uh, and, and things that that does to a person that's having to make adjustments, you know, to, to, to living with, you know, the emotionally unavailable alcoholic that's not present uh, and their needs don't get met, um, you know, in a relationship with them. And, and so therefore it's the birth of codependency. I have dealt with that myself. I, I am a f- full blown, um, recovering codependent. Um, and, and, and I don't know that, um, it will help with, with extreme clarity here, but, uh, in my case, Jill, it's not always the case. Um, but with, with alcoholism and addiction, you know, you can either have a personality disorder underneath of it or, or you can have codependency. And, you know, in, in the programs of AA, you know, when people get sober, they, they say, you know, all, all alcoholics are, are codependents underneath of the drinking. You know, and in my case, that was that was the root cause of, of um, why I was having problems and in pain in life. You know, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll go into that just for a second here. You know, so um, when, when a when a wife is living with an alcoholic that's drinking and that's not present, uh, they, they really truly, uh, aren't getting their needs met. And so they're, they're, they're feeling out of balance and, and not feeling loved or, but, but they start to reach outside of them, uh, and start to develop behaviors like people pleasing because, uh, they're, they're turning inward on themselves that the person at home isn't treating them well, uh, that they're not lovable. Um, you know, of course they're, they're also becoming angry, um, trying to get an active alcoholic drinking, um, and becoming resentful. So the, the whole sub, you know, the side, uh, issue living with an alcoholic, you know, it, uh, that, that becomes a thing all in, up, in and of itself. And the person living with the alcoholic gets sick. Um, and so I, I since, you know, childhood, there, there's been an alcoholism that's run and, and our family, you know, and, and that gets passed down, you know, and, and so I've, I've been involved with programs that are called uh, ACOA, Adult Children of Alcoholic Alcoholics, um, and that dysfunction gets passed down generationally, and it really predisposes you to compulsive caretaking for other people, uh, people pleasing, you know, where, where you're not um, aligned with your true self and that you're jumping in, you know, to get a pat on the back. Um, you, you're, you're, you're just a false self, uh, that that's trying to just be nice to everybody. So people like you and and that you're just giving to everybody, um, you know, you know, uh, to, to make yourself feel better about you. And so, um, 
that that whole program of going down that path of recovering from codependency, which is passed down generationally, and it comes also by living with an alcoholic. You know, there, there's step work. There, it's the program of Al Anon that um, that there's meetings everywhere in St. Louis for all the time. Uh, it really helps the person stay well. Um, it teaches them how they they got sick, and it's the road back to recovery um, of staying well in the the presence of addiction in a family or, or a child. And it, and it really did me a lot of good, Jill, to be involved in that program because I, I didn't really even know that I had codependency issues until well in the sobriety. So Jill, going back, um, how, how this came crashing down in my life was, um, you know, I had three kids, uh, you know, one with my high school, college girlfriend, and then of course my marriage um, with, with two of their and a, a, a thriving business that was growing by leaps and bounds, um, you know, a wife at home and uh, working myself to death, uh, dealing with all the un- unresolved, uh, you know, uh, childhood stuff from the ACOA, adult children of alcoholics, that, that generationally getting passed down. All that wounding and all that work, uh, that, that, all that, all those woundings and, and, and and pain inside of me hadn't been dealt with. I was running from my feelings uh, with work, drinking a lot. Um, and it just became more and more as the responsibilities, um, you know, were, were piling on in my life and I wasn't taking care of myself. Um, I, I got to a point um, two years before I got sober, you know, drinking was a big part of it for me. The, the majority of it and, um, you know, uh, of my lifetime of chemical dependency, you know, all but two years were spent drinking alcohol. And it got to a point where the, the, the usage had just climbed so much, you know, just for me to be able to find some relief in the, in the course of a day to come home and tell myself I deserved, you know, to, to start drinking, you know, because look at, you know, I look around and, hey, I'm growing a business. I'm working hard. I'm providing for my family. I've never been in trouble in my life. You know, all the reasons a person engaged in substance abuse gives themselves um, the rationalizations, you know, why it's okay to keep doing it. And it just kept getting worse and worse. Um, and to a point where I was really becoming miserable inside. And, and I know my body was really struggling as well. I started to need some surgeries um, inside of me. I had a appendectomy um, and I had a some issues going on with a, with a knee. Um, and then I also had back surgery. And, and it was at that point, Jill, of, um, you know, heavy drinking that the the surgery started and the doctors had put me on a lot of painkillers. Um, and you know, I was tired of, of waking up hungover, going to work. Uh, there, there were a lot of problems already associated with, with that and not being able to think clearly because of how much I was drinking. But when I went in to get these surgeries and the doctors put me on the painkillers, um, you know, that, that happy, euphoric feeling I felt from taking those, um, you know, took away my need to drink. And so that was the, uh, birth right there of, of addiction, mm. uh, on a, on a much deeper destructive level, um, in my life. And the, the next two years of my life were absolute hell as, as my, my life got ripped out from underneath of me while I was engaged in the clutches of, of active opiate addiction. So, um, you know, look, looking back from the place I'm in 10 years later, uh, I'm really grateful as silly as that sounds that that part was part of my story. Um, and the reason that I've come to believe is absolutely true is, you know, they say that drugs expedite the acceleration of the disease process, you know, of alcoholism. And, and in my case, it proved very true. Um, I was, um, you know, I was heading down that path of being a lifelong drinker and, uh, that, uh, intervened, if you will. And, and so, um, you know, the, the progression of opiate addiction and how quickly your body becomes physically addicted to it. Um, man, it, 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 Jill, it just happened so fast for me. And I, I knew that I was in serious trouble. And, and, and I remember like sitting in my basement, uh, looking up on, you know, um, opiate addiction and, and, and what that looked like, because I was afraid. Um, 
And, and I didn't know how to ask for help at that time because, you know, here's this guy that doesn't have never been in trouble. Right. And that I'm supposed to be the guy that has his, you know, the business and, and keeping everything together and, and Mr. You know, give to everybody around me, uh, Mr. Kind guy. And, and, you know, internally from, from the amount of opiates that I was putting in my body, you know, I, I, I absolutely couldn't think clear, you know, and, and of course I'm scared to death. And of course I'm spending money on it that, you know, I'm starting to have to explain where that's going. And, and the, you know, at any addict or alcoholic will tell you the walls start really closing in on you. Uh, pe- people start noticing around you that your behavior is changing and, um, you know, and you're, you're, f- fighting and you're scared to death and, and all the things that you've been suppressing, you know, when you're getting to the end of that part of the disease, um, you know, you're, you're having to put a lot of stuff in you to keep the pain down and, and it just becomes too noticeable for everybody around you. And, and, and in my case, I don't really know that anybody knew what to do because I was, I was in denial. I, I was, uh, running away and I, I wouldn't talk to anybody and I was doing my best to hide it. Um, but it just became too obvious. And, and so, you know, the, 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 the last six months, the whole entire train just came crashing down on me to where, um, you know, I, I wasn't ready yet, Jill, to face, you know, uh, and accept the fact that, you know, I have a problem with substances in my life. Um, you know, I, I had this, this wrong, um, perception of what an alcoholic looks like or, or an addict looks like, you know, and, and at that time it was, you know, basically a, a disheveled person living underneath a bridge, you know, not, not a guy and, and, you know, um, that that's got his act together. That's never been in trouble for, I'm, I'm not supposed to be an addict. And, and that, that lie and, and, you know, um, disillusionment, it, 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 it kept me running scared for a while and it kept me, um, got, you know, my, my addiction got to a point where, um, I, I just couldn't lie anymore. And, um, you know, that, that I was scared to death. There were so many consequences of, uh, being involved in all that happening in my life that, that it just became too much. And, um, I came, I came home and, and I admitted, uh, to my wife at the time that, you know, I've got a problem and I need to get some help. And, at that early first attempt at getting sober, <clears throat> um, I didn't know anything about recovery or what it truly looked like, um, and I was I was ashamed of myself horribly that that this had happened in my life, and truthfully wanted people off my back, and I wanted to 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 you know regain their trust, and 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 I didn't I unfortunately for me didn't take um, the gravity of the situation seriously at that time um, and, and, and kind of went to a Band-Aid quick fix and tried to walk back into my life really quickly, um, you know, with with no tools, um, you know, no true desire uh, that I was going to get sober long term, um, you know, o- only this short term thinking of, well, you know, I just, just, it was just a blip in the road. It'll all be okay. Uh, t- type, uh, attitude that, that ultimately really bit me hard, uh, because shortly after that, um, I, I ended up relapsing of course, quietly and silently. And that was the means to the end to me where I just lost everything and life came crashing down. Um, you know, the, the, the doctors had put me on some medicine and I didn't really truly understand it yet. Um, you know, and were, were telling me all these things, but Jill, I, I was still fighting the fact of acceptance that, um, you know, I'm, I'm an alcoholic. And for me to say that out loud, I, it just, it just didn't sound right. It didn't seem right. Uh, and it, and unfortunately it took me, uh, ruining everything at, at that time in my life that I cared about, you know, that I built, that I'd worked hard for. Um, but, uh, that's where my journey began for me that that's, uh, yielded so many miracles and, and so much healing in my life. Um, and, and a much healthier, uh, and, you know, empowered healed version of myself that's, that's here today. Uh, I've been on a, on a 10 year journey from that point. 
um, of, of, of true miracles happening to me a lot with God in my life. Um, I didn't know that really, truly that I was a, a real firm believer, um, uh, before my sobriety journey actually started. Um, but I, but I can, you know, with certainty sit here today and, and, and say to you that without, without that being a part of my life, I never would have made it out of that place that I was in. And so, yeah. And so, um, you know, when, when life, when I hit my bottom, um, and my bottom looked like, uh, going through a divorce and loss of a company and, um, basically, uh, everybody that I've ever known pissed off and disappointed at me. Um, you know, that unfortunately had to be my bottom. And, and I don't know why to this day, why some people have higher bottoms than the other, but that was mine. Um, and you know, it is, it is what it is. And it took that unfortunately for me to wake up that, you know, uh, there was nobody left around me to blame, um, in my life that, you know, uh, that, that they're, they're at fault here and you, because you did this or because you didn't do this, you know, which is typical of, of alcoholic behavior. It took me getting to that point, <clears throat> but really it was that point, Jill, where I was looking at myself one day in the mirror. Um, and I didn't even, I truly, I was living in Sun River village, I believe, uh, or no, excuse me, uh, country club apartments, and, um, you know, looking at myself in the mirror at that point, um, I, I didn't know who I was looking at even anymore. I, my reflection staring back at me was a person that, that had, um, violated every moral he ever had, uh, and compromised every one of them that I just, had, I just had become somebody I didn't know. And I didn't, didn't. There was no excuse. There was no other answers other than, you know, you did this to yourself. And it was that day that I just buckled and I just said, God, if you're there, help me. Um, you know, I, I couldn't stand what I'd done to my family, what I'd done to myself. And I that was the first day that it became real, that, that there was no one left to blame except me. And, and I could see me for for who I'd become and what I had done. And I did not like it. And I knew that you know, my best thinking in life landed me in that position. You know, every, every attempt I made to, con to control the situation and my life, none of it worked. Um, and, and then I knew that, that there was going to have to be something bigger than me to get me out of that place that I was in. And, um, you know, I'd seen those commercials on, on TV with Jeff Perry before, um, you know, that, that God loves you. And mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was because, you know, right around that time that those just kept, they kept getting my attention. And I, I, I said it that day that I was just like, God, you know, I am terribly sorry for what I did. And, and I think what happened that day was I surrendered, you know, I surrendered having a will. I surrendered trying to fix anything. Um, I, I completely surrendered as a person, not, not truly understanding, you know, how I, how all that had happened to me happened to me. Um, and it was really, truly a miracle. You know, I'd had a spiritual awakening, if you will, that day. Um, and, and so, you know, I had been to AA meetings previous to that, um, and that I, I just was still looking for the differences with all those people there as to why I didn't belong there, you know, instead of hearing the similarities and, my, my ears opened up that day, um, you know, and, and I had this desire grow within me and, and to want to become a part of, you know, that program and what it stood for. And, you know, going back, I could see that, hey, you know, these people had been in situations uh, like me and, and here they are happy and they're laughing and, um, you know, they're, they're, they're back in life. And, and I could see that. And, and, and I truthfully, I, I wanted that for myself again. Um, and because my ears could hear now what they couldn't before, um, you know, I, I started to really listen in to the program um, and, and, and hear what it was having to say. And then um, <clears throat> became willing to, to adopt that as a way of life. And it was paramount um, in my recovery. <laughs> Um, and, and a big, big part of it um, for for many, many, many years. Um, 
everything that everything that that program is is based basically on the Bible, the spiritual principles um, taken from it, and um, you know it's 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 a spiritual program that that helps reduce self, right, um, and 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 kind of. Uh, introduces spirituality as a way of life and, and gets you in touch with something bigger than you, which is the core problem with the alcoholic. And so um, my life started to change, Jill, um, uh, and quickly um, and, and, and in positive ways. And, and um, I, I found a very good therapist, God rest her soul, um, Karen, that had ran um, some, some addiction centers here in St. Louis. And, and that, that had become a big part of her life for a number of years and, um, was, was spending a lot of time, a couple of times a week at the beginning of recovery for three or four years with her learning from her, um, you know, and, 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 and it was an added tool in my recovery program. Um, in addition to you know, going to meetings, um, and, and, and finding a sponsor and starting to work through what those steps look like. And, you know, the, the program just yielded me so many life tools that I just didn't have, um, you know, and, and people that have substance abuse problems um, all will tell you the same things that have found long term recovery. They just didn't have these the, the proper tools to cope with life, um, you know, and, and, and most of them are all stunted. Uh, emotionally, um, from, from really what age it is that they started drinking, you know, and, and in my case, it was a 15 year old. And so when you get sober, um, and, and, and after you've been in long-term sobriety, you really truly recognize that, you know, um, whatever age you really did start drinking that, you know, you're, 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 you're stunted to that age and then you're having to walk into life and it, and it takes a while to catch up. But looking back, you know, at my life pre-recovery, uh, being a stunted 15-year-old trying to run a company like that and be a husband and a father, it just was impossible. Uh, there was no way uh, it was going to happen. And so I feel, feel pretty blessed that um, I, st- I stayed on that path of recovery. I had many miracles um, that I still can't even uh, explain today um, that that I think God just picked me in my life, Jill, uh, to, to be a part of that and to um, hopefully represent um, in, a, in a positive way uh, the, the positive side of, of what life looks like, um, you know, as a recovering person and, and what's possible. I know that you are going to send me all the the good stuff that you have in regard to help. And that will be linked up in the show notes at jilldevine.com. I just want to know what's next for you. What do you want to happen, not only with your life, but, and I, I know that you want others to succeed. And I know you want others to get help, but this is also about you, Sean. And I want to make sure that you're on the track to your happiness. Uh, yeah. Thank you for, uh, for, for stating that it's something I've become very aware of the last two years. You know, it's that lifelong need to try to help people. And, uh, and, and that's just not realistic because, you know, I've, I, I, I spent a lot of my life doing that and, and the focus has, sh- has, has, has shifted back to me, Jill. Um, you know, I, I did enjoy being a business owner in my life. And right now, uh, I'm taking, the, the, the necessary steps, um, came close a few times in my life, um, was almost there, um, and and made some, uh, some poor choices around uh, discernment with, with some not so well people that uh, affected, uh, the, the progression of me owning a company again. Um, but I'm there again. And so that's happening in my life. Um, you know, and, and most, I think that I just want is peace, uh, peace, a little bit of joy, a little bit of just healthy living, uh, healthy love in my life and my, to see my kids happy, you know, and, and I'm, I'm considering right now at this moment, um, um, doing a couple of uh, putting myself out there on a forum, uh, to make myself available as a resource to people, uh, that are, that are struggling through abuse situations with narcissists that, uh, are having codependency issues or, or just, uh, acting maybe even, um, just, just private consultation, uh, for families and, and what everybody can do when their loved ones struggle with, with the illness like this, because, 
you know, tough law. People don't make right choices. No one knows what to do. There's there's a lot of enabling in situations like that. And so this has been a part of me that God gave me, I believe. And uh, I think that I've got a lot of, of, of knowledge and wisdom that that I think, Jill, that's going to also be a, a, a secondary business or part of my life that I'm, I'm offering some time. Uh, but I'm looking forward to it. Life is starting to rebuild finally after a, a, a 10 year journey of discovery and healing. And, and I think that I finally come home to who I w- really was underneath all that. Um, and and I'm, I'm very optimistic about the future right now. Before we get to this week's Supermom shout out, I want to highlight one of the sponsors of the podcast, Blondin Real Estate. And as you have probably witnessed recently, the real estate market is crazy. And now is not the time to go with an inexperienced real estate agency. You want to go with the best because things are moving quickly. There are terms that are being thrown out that if the real estate agency you're going with, they're not familiar with, or they just haven't had this kind of situation come up, you will lose the house that you want so badly. So please check out blondinrealestate.com for more. If you're ready, I'm ready. Let's get to this week's Supermom shout out brought to you by Addie's Way. This week's Supermom is going to Ashley of O'Fallon, Missouri. Katie nominated her and said, I think she's an unbelievable supermom for many reasons. She had one child when she met her now husband, and he had four children, and she has never thought of them as stepkids. So anytime anyone asks her how many kids she has, without any hesitation, she says, we have five kids. She loves them like her own unconditionally. She is a working mom of five kids and just went back to school and graduated with a nursing degree and also won the Patient Advocacy Award. She is an amazing coworker and even better friend, and I couldn't be more proud of her. I'm proud of you too, Ashley. Ashley, you are seen and you are supported, and you're going to get that Supermom t-shirt from Addie's Way, so get ready for that. And if you have a nomination, all you have to do is email me, hello at jilldevine.com, or you can go to the website, jilldevine.com, and I have a Supermom shout-out page there where you can see all all of the super moms that have been represented on this podcast. And that's also where there's a nomination form on there. So just get me all that information. If you're going to do it via email, I just need the name of the super mom, your name, because I need to know who's nominating her. Also the reason why and where she's from. And then she'll get that shout out in an upcoming episode. And before we go, my friendly reminder to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast if you get a second or two. And I won't be mad if you tell a few friends about it as well. I appreciate all the support and help in getting the word out about this podcast. So thank you. And thank you for supporting and listening to Two Kids and a Career.